Oh 
Well, is everyone ready to worship God? Yes. Let's worship. Mr. 
victory. Spirit's ever longing for His grace in which to stand. Who is this King of glory, Son of God and Son of Man? His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord of Despite what we see happening and what's going on around us, Lord, you are in control, God. And we know who you are, Lord, and you know who we are, God. And we thank you, Lord, that we have such an amazing creator, such an amazing king. And we get to come here tonight and praise you, Lord. Just bless this time. And may you be glorified and exalted here. In your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and greet each other. Thank you. 
turn to Isaiah chapter 9. I agree. Turn your cell phones off as always. 
you know, the whole routine. Uh, men study tomorrow. They're in the book of Romans. It should be a real treat. Sunday, uh, we'll be having our brothers and sisters from Rock Island join us, so you won't want to miss that. It's always a blessing, and, well, it, it was a blessing the one time, and so it will be, I'm sure, again. They're just such an awesome bunch of brothers and sisters. Prophecy conference at the end of the month up in Appleton. Uh, that should be a real blessing. There's um, information of all of that in the front table as well as other Bible studies throughout the week. If you want to be involved in those, um, sign on up. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, that uh, God, you never fail. That's why we put our trust in you, God. And uh, early on, it can seem like it's too good to be true and can continue to just try and do it again myself, Lord. But thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to go through the tests and the trials that we're subjected to, God, so that we can learn how faithful you are and how true your word is. And I do pray, Lord, as we study your word tonight, that your Holy Spirit would teach us. It's a great passage, Lord. Please open our understanding to what you would have for us, God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're in chapter 9 tonight. We're actually we're going to be picking up at verse 8, but uh, just to set a, just the introduction in the broader context of the book of Isaiah, we're in the midst of a lengthy uh, portion of Isaiah's writing that began with chapter 7, continues through chapter 12. It's one long prophetic passage. It contains a series of of prophecies that proclaim either coming judgment that is to be sent by God or a coming Messiah who will establish an earthly kingdom. The six chapters, 7 through 12, alternate between those two themes, judgment, the Messiah, and they provide what is basically a microcosm of the biblical message overall, that there will be a penalty, there are consequences for sinful activity and rebellion against God. But God in his mercy has provided a redeemer who will bring beauty from ashes if I will trust him. He brings life from death. He brings redemption through judgment. So this lengthy prophecy has been recognized throughout history as providing some of the most amazing insights into the nature and identity of the promised redeemer, the Messiah, who we know as our Lord Jesus Christ. For instance, after a declaration of the judgment that was coming on the southern kingdom of Judah due to their rejection of God's words of warning to them, in chapter 8, chapter 9 began, verse 1 of chapter 9, nevertheless. So it's like he lays out this judgment. It's going to be, you know, they, they brought it upon themselves and judgment was going to come nevertheless. It says, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as when at first he highly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. And as we studied the beginning of chapter 9, we see it went on to describe Israel's Redeemer who would be coming out of Galilee he would be showing forth a great spiritual light in verse 2 of chapter 9. He would be bringing with him a joyful spiritual harvest of souls with a prophetic description that is applied to Jesus in the New Testament when it says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now in verse 8, where we pick up tonight, the extended prophecy switches back to that of judgment. This time the judgment is leveled against the northern kingdom, as is made clear in the introduction, verse 8, the Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria. 
And so here, after the death of King Solomon, the 12 tribes of Israel, also known as Jacob, Jacob, the patriarch whose name was switched to Israel, the 12 tribes split into two nations. Ten tribes in the north continued to be called Israel, as is sp spoken of here. But they also went by the name of their most prominent tribe, Ephraim. So that defines this, as you see in verse 9. The northern kingdom established their capital in Samaria, which you see also in verse 9. The southern tribes of Judah, Benjamin, became an independent nation known as Judah, who retained the capital of Jerusalem and temple worship. The two nations, north and south, remained separate. They remained opposed to one another for several centuries. Now, interestingly, here Isaiah, who lived in Jerusalem, was a prophet sent primarily to the southern kingdom. Here he delivers a prophecy against the northern kingdom. A word against Jacob, verse 8, regarding what has fallen on Israel. Not what will fall or what may come. This is what has come what has been decreed for the northern kingdom, a prophetic judgment that Isaiah was to proclaim so that all the people will know, verse 9 says. It's like, write this down for future reference so that anyone who is interested can know the judgment that God had determined upon the northern kingdom in advance. So I can read this and go, Lord, the Lord spoke this before their judgment came upon them. Now, as so often is the case with such a creative God, this prophetic passage out of this lengthier, you know, series of prophecies, this particular passage changes to a different literary style, to a poetic form. That isn't, isn't as evident in the English translation, but the structure is made clear in the text through the repetition of a line at the end of each of the four po poetic stanzas. First at the end of verse 12, where it says, For this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Then you go to the end of verse 17. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You go to the end of verse 21. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And then at the end of verse 4, chapter 10, it says, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. This is a, a poetic passage. It's written in the original Hebrew. It's got a, a rhythm to it. But at that point then, at verse 5 of chapter 10, the, the new prophetic passage begins, and we'll see that next time. So that... You know, this, so that's the context here. Stanza 1, verse 8. The Lord sent a prophetic word regarding what has fallen judgment-wise upon Israel. It's written so that all the people will know. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will, we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on. The Syrians before, the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, Isaiah prophesied at a time when the Assyrian Empire was seeking to establish dominance over the entire Middle East. You can read about this in your history books. You probably won't learn about it if you're in public school, but Assyria was like the first empire that was aggressively pursuing world conquest. They were you know, going around and taking over smaller nations and building this larger empire. Their capital was the city of Nineveh in modern-day Iraq. And you see, like Nahum, the minor prophet, is written particularly towards the destruction. And Assyria is dealt with in much of the Old Testament history books. But they had already invaded the territory of the northern kingdom once and had caused severe damage. This prophecy is to the Jews inhabiting the northern kingdom, 
who had turned away from God immediately after the, the kingdom split. They turned away from God, were serving earthly idols, and so instead of repenting after they were attacked and returning to God for help, after that initial attack by the Assyrian army, they only became hardened in their pride and arrogance of heart, verse 9 says, saying basically in verse 10, we're going to rebuild even stronger. We're going to overcome adversity by our own strength, replace bricks with hewn stone and sycamores with cedar. Now the language there in verse 10 is exhibiting a spirit of defiance. It's not just, you know, we're going to do this and make our nation stronger. This is spoken in a spirit of, we'll show God that we don't need him. They were very aware that the trouble that had come to them was a judgment from God. But they in their pride were saying that they would convert divine justice into national advantage. We'll show you. Now, on a side note... Let me share with you an article because this hits close to home. This is an article that came out, and you may or may not have remembered this. But the, the day after the terrorist attack that took down the Twin Towers in New York City, and it, it said this, this was the government's response through a man named Tom Daschle. This is what he spoke to the media the next day after this huge tragedy, September 12th. He said, I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. But there's a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to us all at times like this. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. That is what we will do, he said. We will rebuild and we will recover. So spoke United States Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, September 12, 2011, in response to the, the shocking uh, terrorist attacks the day before. That was the government's response to the day, the day after the attack. The article went on to say Daschle's comments impressed many at the time but he would have done well to consider the passage in context. The Lord sent a word against Jacob. It has fallen on Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down. We will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores cut down. We'll replace them with cedars. What an irony, the writer of the article said, Isaiah's condemnation of national confidence used with pride by an American political leader to boast of his nation's resilience. Now, it's no coincidence, I'm sure. And you see what has transpired in our nation from that time, the things that happened, and many picked up on that when that went on. But Isaiah condemned the northern kingdom's arrogance and prophesied what the Lord's response would be. Because of that, you know, just arrogance against the Lord, therefore, because of their foolish presumption, verse 11, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rezin against him and spur his enemies on. Now, Rezin was the leader of Syria, not Assyria, just Syria at that time. Their capital was Damascus. It still is. Damascus is the oldest continually inhabited city in the world. And we're going to, in a few weeks, we're going to get to chapter 17, where there's a prophecy here that says Damascus is going to be destroyed in one day. It hasn't happened yet. They have been, like I said, the oldest continually inhabited city. But according to Isaiah 17, there's going to come a time where they're going to be gone, the city. And if you watch the news at all, you know that Israel is not taking any guff from these people. They are, they are bombing and they just killed somebody there in Syria that was a strategic leader of Iran. But at this time, Syria was an ally with the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel had formed an alliance with several smaller nations against Assyria. They were you know, under this resin, their king, and they were against the mighty Assyrian empire. What's being prophesied here is that Israel's ally, God's saying, this is the first thing that's going to come upon you. 
your allies, Rezin, a king of Syria, is going to turn against Israel, join forces with the Assyrian Empire against the northern kingdom of Israel. So Israel's earthly allies that they were putting all their trust in, we don't need God, we got alliances with these other nations. Instead of trusting the Lord, those same allies are going to turn on Israel and be instrumental in their overthrow. The Syrians before verse 12, so first the Syrians would turn against Israel, and then another local ally of theirs, the Philistines, from behind, verse 12. And so the Philistines, you know, would come next. They would follow after Syria and also help devour the northern kingdom of Israel using poetic language of a ravenous beast. So the northern kingdom of Israel is going to get thrown under the bus, so to speak, by their friends. For all of this, it says there at the end of verse 12, his anger, God's anger, is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now this phrase that's repeated at the end of each stanza, it's not a statement of relief or mercy, as though God is extending his hand, please come back, a hand of reconciliation. This is declaring that even after that betrayal that was to come by their supposed allies as a judgment from God, God's hand of judgment was still stretched out against them. There was still judgment to come. For or because, verse 13 says, the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows, and for everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out, his hand of judgment. Now this stanza speaks of the attack that was going to come upon the northern kingdom by the Assyrians that it would bring devastation upon all classes of society, according to verse 14, in one day. So very violent, very sudden, destructive event that would be over really fast, and it would affect everybody, the whole nation, because, as verse 13 says, the people don't turn to him who strikes them. This is referring to the design behind God's chastisement of his people. Whether it's a nation, an individual, or you know, a church, whatever it is, there's a design behind judgment. God, God's design is to turn his people back to him, to his care and protection. That design had not been accomplished in the case of the northern kingdom through the destruction that had already come in hopes of returning to God by, the, by his people. So that's the main element of judgment that people fail to see in the midst of it. That it, it, judgment is imposed ultimately out of divine mercy. If there was not divine mercy, there would be no, no such thing as judgment. There would be only condemnation and destruction. Judgment includes justice. Judgment includes grace. Judgment in, includes forgiveness but it requires turning to the one who strikes them, as it says here. The verb is literally returning in the case of the Jews. Speaking of humbling themselves, God's, God judges with the intent of the person judged saying, God, forgive me. I confess, you know, I turn from that. And God is welcoming, you know, that repentance with forgiveness and open arms always. But if people won't do it, then, you know, he has no other choice but to, but to destroy. But that returning speaks of humbling and repentance, seeking forgiveness from the one that they left who was trying to bring them back from their self-destruction. It's because of their refusal to do so that such extreme measures are brought. The Lord will cut off, verse 14 says, They'll cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. Because of their refusal, 
God has no recourse but to pass from correction to destruction if he is going to remain just, which he will. The language is speaking of the thoroughness with which their ruin is going to come from the highest to the lowest and everything in between. The palm branch is way up high on the tree. The palm fronds are way up there. The bulrush is basically a root plant. It's down on the ground. It's walked over. And so God brings the necessary ruin in one day. It's the thing you notice throughout the Bible. God is, God is slow to anger. But when such outcome is required, it's swift and complete. He doesn't torture people. You know, I'm going to make you, that's what Satan does. He doesn't make people twist. You know, it's like when God is done and there's no more room for, you know, repentance because they won't repent, then it's over. Now, greater insight is given into the condition of the society there in the northern kingdom that led to their destruction in verses 15 and 16. And this is where, you know, it's, it, people like us need to take heed. It says, the elder and honorable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Isaiah's intention here much like the prophet Jeremiah is to express how the lowest people on the societal ladder, it's not the homeless people, it's not the drug addicts or the violent criminals, you know, they're bad, but the lowest people of society are false prophets who ultimately lead the whole nation into self-destruction. The elder and the honorable, verse 15, that would be those who are in positions of leadership over the people, the kings, the princes, those who are viewed as having authority over the nation. The prophet who teaches lies is the tail. That would be considered the lowest of low. That is a very derogatory description when you look at it in the original language, what it's describing where the tail is. This is what the false prophet is the lowest of the low. They were the ones, it says, so the people who teach lies are the tale. They were the ones, however, that the leaders would look to for their spiritual guidance. Just like politicians do today. Politicians like Tom Daschle. You, you know, you read that article and you think, where was he getting his spiritual you know, information from to tell the public this, you know? He doesn't even read the passage. He doesn't even know the context. In, in, in you know, his ignorance, he's, he's basically declaring our defiance against God. You think, where does he get his information from? From some false prophet. Somebody didn't say, don't say that, dude. That's, that, that's the wrong way to put that passage. He said, you say that people think you're really smart and biblical. But see, this shows how important it is to know what I believe, dude. Who am I listening to? If, there's, if those being looked to for moral, ethical guidance, those claiming to be speaking for God, if they are speaking lies and are themselves unethical and immoral, if they're spiritually lost, they will influence the leaders, verse 16, who in turn will cause the people then to err. And those who allow themselves to be led by misguided leaders, verse 16 says, they're destroyed. But you see how it's all traced back to these wicked spiritual teachers. That's why it's no coincidence when you get to the New Testament, when it comes to spiritual leaders of the Lord's church, pastors, elders, deacons, it's no coincidence there are three pastoral epistles as they're called, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, devoted to spiritual leadership. And they're not all devoted to just what the leadership should do. They're devoted to, if I am in the congregation, to judge and evaluate the leadership of the church. 1st Timothy chapter 3 in particular, 17 specific characteristics are listed to which a pastor is to be held to. Only one of them is apt to teach. It's not, dude, he should be a dynamic, you know, speaker to the people, very charismatic, nothing like that, thankfully, or I would be disqualified, you know. It's just the only 17 characters in one, it's just, and he should be able to teach. The other 16 characteristics deal with morality, integrity, 
you know, not that anyone is perfect, but there is, a, a, in Christian leadership, there's to, those in leadership are to be held to a higher standard. And they better be. Because you and I, all of us know, have known people, I know people, Calvary Chapel pastors who have been leading tens of thousands of people and fallen from that position are leading some double life. You know, having affairs and all these things. But unfortunately, see what you see so often today is that a Christian leader is evaluated as to how charismatic they are. What they look like, how entertaining, how popular. And that's why our society is in the state that it's in. You know, which it, the New Testament says those days are going to come. That that's going to be the state of Christianity. The last days are going to have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Second Timothy three five, people not enduring sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, heaping to themselves teachers who turn them away from the truth and unto fable. Second Timothy four four. I would encourage you to study those epistles, especially anyone who, if I'm gonna, if I was taking my family to a new church, that's how I would evaluate. I wouldn't say, oh, they got a great worship team, you know, oh, they're so great and they're so hip and cool, you know. And say, oh, that's fine, you know, if they're good, great. If I can worship the Lord, but you know, what? How is this based upon Scripture here? You know, such spiritual leaders, according to this, they're the lowest of the low. Selfishly espousing false teaching that people want to hear for their own personal financial benefit and popularity unto the whole nation's destruction. Dude, there are pastors today who pastor large churches and you know who they are, you, you should, you know, I mean, these guys, they pastor gigantic churches. They do not espouse any biblical doctrine. They espouse, you know, feel-good psychology. And thousands of people are going thinking we're at a Christian church. And, you know, you don't have to ask me, who cares what I say? Look at what the Bible says and look, is this what the Bible says? And you'd have to say, no, it's not. And so I would encourage anybody. But see, that's the worst. It doesn't, neg but see, it doesn't negate the accountability. That's what it's saying here of those listening that follow them, it says, unto their own destruction, which that is what's happening today. Just as it was in Isaiah's day, because the people allowed themselves to be led by false teachers, therefore, verse 17 says, the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows. They're all hypocrites and evildoers. See, nobody's going to be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know, especially in a country like ours, dude, where we can gather on a Friday night and study every word of this book. Should be. We have the word of God engraved in the halls and walls of our nation's capitals. And at least for the time being, we have these freedoms. The Jews in Isaiah's day also knew where to find the truth in the Holy Scriptures. As Isaiah proclaimed back in chapter 8, verse 20, he told the remnant that was still listening, he said, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. The Jews especially, they knew where to look to evaluate their spiritual leadership. They had the Torah delivered to them from God himself. You have passages such as Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 18, specifically speak of how to discern whether or not someone claiming to be speaking for God was legitimate or not. But see, the problem with the northern kingdom in that day, just as it is in countries like ours, from top to bottom, they didn't want to obey God. It wasn't like they're you know, looking for the truth. They just didn't want to obey God. They wanted to be God's chosen people, but they wanted to also worship idols of immorality and sin. Just like, you know, the longest time the United States wants to be known as a Christian nation while, you know, celebrating increasing depravity. Now it's like we don't even want to be a Christian nation to most people, unfortunately. But see, that's how the, the northern kingdom was, and God just calls it as it is. There in verse 17, they're, they're hypocrites and evildoers. Even notice the fatherless and the widows. 
those who were normally the objects of God's special care, even though those were swept up in this. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns as a fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim. Ephraim Manasseh, together they shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is still stretched out. Now, I can't forget, again, that these passages of Scripture are meant specifically for future generations like us to take heed from. Isaiah was told to write this down for everybody else, that all the people will know, verse 9. Those who are being written about this northern kingdom were to be destroyed. This wasn't for them. It was too late for them. That's a, you know, it wasn't like God saying, please come back. He had done that. They didn't. Now write this down for everybody in future generations. This is how they're going to be judged and why they're going to be judged. God could have just been done with them. But see how merciful of him to basically explain why they, they were to be destroyed so as to leave a lesson for others to learn from. In verse 13, it was because they refused to turn back in repentance. Here it's because such wickedness, verse 18, as the northern kingdom had devolved into, unrepented wickedness ultimately causes a nation to destroy itself. For wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars, thorns, kindle the thickets of the forest, and shall mount up like rising smoke. Now the first stanza, verses 8 through 12, spoke of the northern kingdom's prideful self-assurance in their sinful state. The second stanza, verses 13 through 17, spoke of their refusal to repent. This third stanza speaks of how the wickedness of a nation such as Israel at that time ends up consuming them. It's like national suicide. This is why God brings such swift destruction. He can't bear to see his people just self-destruct like that. Now it begins the way that this poetry, this poem is written, poetic language, it begins this, this national suicide, it begins consuming the lowest of people among the national population, just as fire begins by consuming the briars and thorns, verse 18 speaks of the scrub brush that's half dead already. It's easily ignited and it just it fuels a fire to get it going. In the progression here, our digression, really, wickedness begins among those in the society who live and die for sin alone. But like how a fire then inflames greater fuel, it kindles the thickets of the forest, verse 18. That's speaking of bigger trees that take longer to ignite, but when they do, that's when greater destruction is caused. That's where it moves up, you know, the societal ladder into, you know, people who are supposed to be refined or whatever, people in supposed higher classes of society. It ends up infecting greater elements within society, and then, you know, it doesn't really go away. More and more people are infected with the wickedness until the whole nation mounts up like rising smoke, it says. Just like how when you dr you're driving and you see this gigantic cloud of smoke, you know, you know there's an out-of-control fire from, the, from, this, from a distance because there there's a, must be a huge fire over there. And that's how it is with a nation whose society is completely given over to wickedness. Its self-destruction is visible to everybody else. They look from afar off and go, dude, those poor people, man. <laughs> Their society is falling apart. As is pointed out in this prophecy once again, that sinful self-destruction is divinely appointed. It's a penalty of God. It's evidence of God's hand of grace just being removed. If his hand, when his hand is on the nation, he keeps 
the wickedness suppressed, but his judgment will be fine. You want to live that way? All he's got to do is remove his hand of grace. And by this point, it had been completely lifted off. Verse 19, through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up. And the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother. The people shall be fuel for the fire by the hand of the one, by, uh, by the hand of one another, it says. The picture that is painted here is how a nation in self-destruction mode is a nation that ends up in civil war. It's a nation that ends up with blue states and red states. That, you know, people are moving to, you know, a red state because I don't want to live in a blue state anymore. You know, I mean, there's such division, fighting against itself, not willing to spare their own brother. In reality, they're just killing themselves, is what verse 20 says. He shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. The nation is here personified as being like someone who's gone crazy to the point of cutting and tearing their own body. As gross as that is, you know, that's a picture of a nation that God has left to their own wickedness. I was in a prison two weeks ago, and just to get out of some duty, a prisoner bit off his own finger. And they think, you know, you couldn't believe someone would do that, but that's where someone gets who's gone crazy. As gross as it is, it's a picture. God's saying this is where they're going to devolve to in their wickedness, self-destruction. For the northern kingdom, it says in verse 21, Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh. And together, they'll be against Judah. Now, Ephraim and Manasseh were not just two of the nor ten northern king tribes. They were descendants of the two sons of Joseph. Those two tribes in particular were close blood relatives. They're all cousins. But they ended up fighting against one another. The northern kingdom had violent divisions. You read the history books here in the Bible. Just between themselves, at one point they had two kings, you know, and they're all fighting against each other, just there in that one kingdom. The only thing that would bring them together, you know, they didn't need outside forces to destroy them. They had plenty to fight about. The only thing that they could get together on was mutual opposition against Judah, against the other Jews. And they, they could all, we could rally against them, the southern kingdom, who were also blood relatives of theirs. God's chosen people destroying themselves. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners and they shall fall among the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So here a fourth indication that God had given the northern kingdom over to destruction is a totally corrupt judicial system. Now, thankfully, we don't have to have that in our country, you know. But there's no, abil no ability, it's saying, to regulate fairness amongst themselves. There was a whole formal system of justice. They had judges. They had courts. But it was used for making unjust laws. It was used for political means and for handing down unfair sentences. See, the things you see going on in the world today, it's nothing new. Dude, you read the Bible, and, and it wasn't even new to them. You can go back in the history before the northern kingdom, but God says, write this down so that if anyone wants to know, here's why they were judged. There are those with no ability to defend themselves, the poor the widows, orphans, they were the ones being taken advantage of. Those who, who would oppress helpless people were uh, on earth, you know, that it says here that, you know, they were oppressing helpless people on earth. You may be above the reproach of human courts, you know. He's saying you, you may get away with it here. 
But verse 3 asks there, what are you going to do in the day of punishment? You know, you think you're getting away with it here. What are you going to do in, in, the, in, in the desolation which is going to come from afar? Where are you going to flee then? Where we leave your glory? So the first sentence of verse 3 is literally, what will you do in the day of visitation? It's speaking of this coming Assyrian invasion that God was bringing that is going to just destroy the nation. It won't exist anymore. It's bring a finality to their existence. The question, uh, the, all these questions, of course, are rhetorical. What are you going to do when the desolation comes from afar? Where are you going to flee for help? Where will you leave your glory, he asks at the end of verse 3. That's speaking of their worldly wealth and their treasure. Where are you going to put that for safekeeping when the mighty Assyrian army comes the second time? The answer to these taunting questions is given in verse 4, where he says, without me, you, you are going to be prisoners, or you're going to die. They're either going to be taken into captivity, you shall, they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. You're either going to be taken prisoner or killed. That was the two options remaining for the nation without God. And yet, in keeping with the structure of the poem here, it ends, for all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Well, how can his hand be stretched out still when the nation no longer exists? But this is insinuating that even further judgment awaits those of the northern kingdom than that which was experienced under the Assyrians. That's a fate that some see fulfilled under the Romans several centuries later. Because it's interesting that those same northern territories were populated once again at the time of Christ. And they did suffer similar destiny once more after their rejection of Jesus. They were some of the first to be destroyed when the Romans came in under Titus and did destroy the city of Jerusalem. But either way, Isaiah was to write all this down so that all the people will know that none of what happened to the northern kingdom happened out of coincidence or out of the will of God. You wonder, we're talking about on the radio program today, you know, you wonder the things that are going on in our country right now. You, know, you all know there's an earthquake there in New York this morning. Many people don't know the earthquake took place right during a meeting about Israel. You can see the video on the internet. It's pretty wild because all of a sudden the meeting stops, you know, and they're, they're trying to condemn Israel, and all of a sudden, you know, there's an earthquake. Two, two days ago, the Statue of Liberty got hit by lightning. You know, we had a barge that destroys, you know, the guy who wrote our national anthems, you know, bridge. Sometimes, you know, and I'm trying to be one of these guys, oh, look at that, I'm going to write a book, you know. But you go, that's, that's pretty interesting. I'm going to stick with what the Bible says. But sometimes you got to figure God is trying to get people's attention in a lot of ways. And he wrote this down, you know, just so people know that this, this was not just coincidence, but this was out of the will of God. Now, verse 5 picks up a whole new prophetic passage, deals with the Assyrians, who were nothing more than an instrument in God's hand carrying out his, wo his work. And we'll see that next time we pick up there. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you, God, that God, you've written these things down. I personally, I love it, Lord. I, I, I want to know this, God. But even more so, God, I want to do it. I want to practice it, not just go, hmm, that's, that's interesting. And I'm glad I have that information. Now I'm, now I'm doubly accountable, God. And so please, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring these, these principles and these spiritual uh, just characteristics to mind and just be alert the days we're living in. Thank you that we can study your word, study Bible prophecy, Lord. And we pray come quickly until you do. Lord, may we just be continually interceding on behalf of our nation and one another. Lord, in one accord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned on in this earth this world lord the universe <laughs> lord we we have you god and you have us and we just thank you thank you so much we love you lord we thank you in jesus name amen go ahead and pray with each other My place is stood condemned. 